It turns out that we can't really measure the water content of soil in the field directly. So instead, what we do is we measure a property that depends on the water content, and we pick a property that can be measured and determined with a sensor. And there are three main properties for doing this. One is electrical resistivity, the other is the ability of the soil to scatter neutrons, and the other is the dielectric constant of the soil. So the electrical resistance of the soil will depend on what the water content is. The electrons aren't really transmitted through solid material in the soil very much, and so the ability to transmit electrons really depends on the water content. So here's a sensor that uses this property. This is a porous material with uh, two electrodes embedded in it, and you use, an, a, use a sensor up here at the ground surface to determine the electrical resistance uh, between these two electrodes embedded in this material. Maybe they look something like that. Okay, and so this is I embedded in some soil out here, and the water in the pores of the sensor equilibrates with the water out here in the soil and the electrical resistance inside of the sensor varies as a result. So sometimes these sensors are made with a porous material out of uh, porous uh, nylon or fiberglass. This is strong material, relatively inert. Uh, you can put it in the soil, it's fairly durable. The downside of this though is that the, uh, that the water that would get into the pores of the nylon and change its electrical resistivity um, will also carry with it the solutes that are in the uh, soil. And so the electrical resistivity that you measure for uh, with this particular sensor will depend on the water content and the solutes that are dissolved in it. As electrolytes become, uh, as the electrolyte concentration increases, the electrical resistivity uh, will decrease. So you want to get the water content, but you have this confounding factor of uh, variable electrolytes in the water causing a, a change in electrical resistance. And so what can be done then is to make the porous material out of uh, gypsum. Plaster of Paris is made of gypsum and you can mold it and cast uh, the sensor out of uh, Plaster of Paris fairly easily. And when you do this, the, uh, the soil water equilibrates with this porous gypsum and the, the water that's in the, uh, in the sensor that's in contact with the gypsum, gypsum is quite soluble, and so that water that's in that gypsum will become saturated in calcium sulfate. And so the composition of the water in the gypsum is held constant because of the solubility of the calcium sulfate. And so as a result of that, the electrical resistance is independent of the electrolyte concentration out in the soil. So that gives a, an advantage to the, the gypsum block. These gypsum blocks were one of the early soil moisture sensors. They're still available today. Um, and I think they're used in some cases, but there are probably other sensors that uh, have uh, superseded these uh, gypsum blocks. So we can also measure the moisture content of soils using the ability of the soil to scatter neutrons. And so what's done is to have a, a sensor here that has a radioactive source that emits neutrons. And when, let me do a little sketch. So here's your radioactive source and it causes neutrons to come flying out of there. Uh, and what happens then is the neutrons hit various things in their path. And if the if you, neutrons are pretty small, and so if you have a neutron flying along and it hits a, a big atom, then it's going to bounce off. And essentially it's like a, a billiard ball hitting a, a solid object. When it hits this large atom, then uh, it maintains really its kinetic energy because it's it's bouncing off and it's not really putting much kinetic energy into this large atom because the, the large atom is is not going to move. But if you have a small neutron hitting a hydrogen atom, uh, the hydrogen atom is about the same size, about the same mass as the neutron, uh, 
and so when it hits it it's gonna cause some uh, kinetic transfer the hydrogen will start moving and when it bounces off it'll slow down because it's transferring some of its kinetic energy into the hydrogen okay so what you do is have this radioactive source and then you have a sensor that can detect these slow neutrons uh, neutrons that have uh, hit hydrogen and have been slowed down as a result so the the neutron would come out it would hit this guy and some of them would bounce back and hit the detector okay so that's what's being shown here here are these with these this diagram up here these neutrons are coming off coming out from the, the radioactive source they're hitting hydrogens and they're bouncing around and some of them are bouncing back and being detected Okay, so the presence of hydrogen really is, uh, is an indication of the water content. Clays have some hydrogen, uh, that certainly is true, uh, and so that will be a factor. But by and large, when you're measuring the hydrogen content, you're measuring water in soils. So the, this, is a, this is basically a probe that can be lowered down into the soil. You need an access tube and that's shown here schematically you lower it down the neutrons come out and the, they affect a region around the device that's um, roughly uh, roughly the uh, football size that basic geometry these things are uh, here's a picture of one of these neutron probes the probe itself is about a foot long and the region that it that it senses is football or maybe beach ball uh, size uh, region. So these are pretty effective. You can move them up and down a hole. You could measure it here. So you can get a profile of the water content. So that's uh, that's pretty handy. You can go back to the same location and survey it multiple times. So you could see how the moisture content changes with time. So that's, uh, that's helpful. Um, some of the downsides, though, is that uh, the safety precautions. Uh, this is a radioactive source, and so you need to be careful about that. You have to have a special permit in order to have this radioactive source. Uh, that can be a difficulty. If the soil has a lot of clays in it, and the clays have um, water associated with them, then that could be... Um, that could be a, a problem and also if this tubing here the access tubing if that's made of plastic then plastic has hydrogen in it and so that can attenuate the neutrons independent of the water content uh, in order to get this to work you have to calibrate it for each location uh, in order to really get the best resolution out of it and that that's feasible to do you would take a core as you install this access tube so this is a neutron probe, and um, these are fairly widely used. Um, actually, there you can see the, the access casing for this neutron probe. These are fairly widely used. Um, we have used these at field camp in the past, um, but we don't own one. We, we arranged to have one uh, here at field camp to, to be used. Um, but um, we don't own one. It's fairly um, it requires a fair amount of logistics to own one of these things because it has to be uh, has to be stored in a special lead line locker. You need to have some permitting from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and so uh, that all increases the degree of difficulty of operating one of these systems. So another way of measuring moisture content in the field is to exploit the dependence of the dielectric constant uh, of the soil on the water content. Now the dielectric constant is really a measure of how a material responds to a high frequency electrical pulse. And as, as you put in this high frequency pulse, what happens is that polar molecules like water will tend to reorient themselves and that causes and basically the inertia that it takes for the polar molecules to reorient themselves causes the high frequency pulse to slow down um, and so by 
by doing that, um, by, well, basically by measuring how it slows down, we can then estimate what the dielectric constant is. And here's why this is an effective measure of water content. These data here are the dielectric constants of the various components of soil. And you can see that the dielectric constant of water is um, more than 10 times higher than the solids, the minerals like quartz and, and clays. And uh, it's almost two orders of magnitude higher than, than air. So if we can measure the dielectric constant of the soil, that that will be um, that will be that will reflect in a very strong way the presence of the water in the soil, the the fraction, the volumetric fraction of water in the soil. So there are a couple ways of doing this, and time domain reflectometry is what's being shown here. Uh, the TDR technique uses a, a fairly sophisticated electronics box here. Uh, and this is what's go, what goes in the soil. This is called a waveguide, and it consists of uh, three steel rods. And the way it works is the waveguide, let's say it's uh, this block here, and there are these three steel rods. And the way it works is you have the electrical box here, and, uh, and you put a pulse down this uh, wire. This is a coaxial cable that goes down the wire. And actually, it's just a high frequency signal that, that goes down. But let's just think of it as an individual, very short pulse. And so it moves down the wire. And then it enters into this waveguide. And the, the way to think about it is that a coaxial cable, if you were to cut this, a coaxial cable looks like this. There's a center conductor and there's an outer conductor, and there's an insulator between the two. So the coaxial cable goes down, and the center conductor is connected to this, uh, this rod here. And this outer conductor is connected to these two rods here. And so this uh, electromagnetic pulse, a, a voltage pulse, uh, moves down this wire and then it enters into this waveguide and uh, as it goes down through the waveguide it's uh, it is basically a, a pulse that's going along like so and you have a voltage difference between this internal rod and the the two external ones that's what really characterizes this pulse and so it moves along the these rods and as it does the, that, it's interacting with the soil. So this material out here um, is, is the soil. This, this thing, this waveguide is pushed into the soil. And so as it does that, the, um, the speed with which this pulse moves along these rods depends on the dielectric constant of the material around it. And the higher the dielectric constant, the slower this pulse will move through, move along these rods. So it'll, it goes along the rods and then it hits the end and it reflects back. It goes back and then gets back into this coaxial cable and comes back here and it's detected by the box. Okay, so the coaxial cable, it, this is a very uniform material uh, it's it's very well known how these pulses move along this cable and so what you get then is a response back at the box that is really just dependent on how the pulse is moving through these rods and the big thing that's affecting that is how the pulse interacts with the material that envelops the rods and in particular what the dielectric constant of that material is going to do to the the pulse and and basically basically the higher the dielectric constant the more it's going to slow down the pulse and that property is what's used to estimate the dielectric constant and then by knowing the dielectric constant you can correlate that with the water content so the the plus side of this is that it's relatively independent of soil type depends on how much water there is, 
but the, the type of solids that are there don't really matter so much. It's pretty easy. Uh, once you have one of these devices and you have all of the, the gear, pretty easy to set up and run. You don't have to have special licenses and permits. It's pretty fast. Um, the, the downside is that uh, it can r require some interpretation of the wave. That you send this pulse down and then when it comes back, on the display, you have some wave that's uh, that's displayed here. It's actually shown on that screen right there, and you have to do a little bit of interpretation, um, and so that requires some judgment. And I'll show you in another video how that's done. We have one of these things, and and you you'll need to know how to make that interpretation. Um, it also requires fairly expensive electronics. This thing, uh, you can see that it's about the size of a large lunchbox, and it's packed full of electronics, so it's fairly expensive. OK, so another way to estimate the water content is to determine the capacitance of the soil. And this is going to be a function of the dielectric constant. And there are uh, a couple of ways of doing this. This is a probe that's lowered down in an access tube so it's it works much like a neutron probe does in that you can do a, a profile and you don't have to have any sensors that you leave in the ground you can just uh, run a profile at any position along this access tube that you want so that has some advantages but um, the way that this uh, approach this uh, capacitance approach is done for the most part is with a sensor like this and this is a, a sensor that has they have a little bit of electronics in here and then these uh, forks are pushed into the soil and they um, they are able to detect the dielectric constant of the soil there's a high frequency pulse that's generated and the dielectric constant is estimated and then that is correlated to the water content and what I'm showing here, this is what's known as the top equation. Uh, it's right there. And what it's doing is relating that guy. That's the dielectric constant. And if you know the dielectric constant, you can substitute it into this equation and calculate the volumetric water content. So this probe, this is about this is a couple inches long here. So it's pretty small, and you can just push it into the soil. There's a, an electrical cable that goes up to a, a box. Could be a data logger, or it could be just a handheld box with a display that uh, displays the water content. Um, so pretty simple, pretty easy to use. And you can monitor it as a function of time. So you can track the changes in water content as a function of time. Or you could push it into a soil, allow it to equilibrate, make a reading, and then pull it out and go on to the next location. So it's fairly versatile. These are uh, relatively inexpensive compared to the other sensors that we've seen. And uh, this, I would say, is probably the most widely used method for sensing the uh, moisture content of soils that's in use today. We'll have some exercise that use uh, this particular sensor.